You might have worked out by now that I'm quite excited about the whole process of playing solo saxophone gigs. And that's because so many of our sax school students are actually out now gigging doing solo saxophone gigs. So perhaps you've seen the videos I did recently where we spoke to Andy, who started out with a very small setup. Then there's Wolfgang, who's doing jazz gigs. But today I'm talking with another one of our members, GB Sneed. He lives in Florida in the States. He's a sax school member. And he's doing some really, really cool gigs as a smooth jazz commercial type saxophone player with a bigger setup. So this conversation is packed with great information. You'll learn why GB had to upgrade his PA system and how you can work out whether it's right for you to have a smaller system or a larger PA system when you're performing live. GB actually started learning when he was a police chief back in his old city that he used to live in. And he started doing gigs there, but since he's moved to a new town. So check out the tips later on in this session where he explains how he had to go through this process to go and find new gigs and make a bunch of connections. There's some really great tips in there too. Oh, just before we dig into the conversation, don't forget if you haven't got it already, we've got a free PDF where we've distilled all the information from these three videos and a bunch of extra tips too. It's our guide to how you can play solo saxophone. It's completely free. The link to how you can get your copy of it is in the description down below. Go grab your copy. Let's dig into this conversation with GB. So GB, I love the videos that you share in our community about your uh, performing. You're out doing a lot of really interesting stuff. And I know you're really into your commercial music and your smooth jazz, that kind of thing. But I'd love to know how you got started with your setup. So how did you, what was the first sort of setup that you put together for going out and playing live? You know, starting out in the US 10 years ago, and when I started out, I didn't know what I was doing, uh, completely ignorant. Um, and the, my my uncle who plays, he had this elaborate setup that was probably from the 1960s. And I knew that I didn't want to carry all of those big pieces of equipment around. And so I went out and bought a thump speaker and I plugged in my thump speaker into my uh, computer and that was how I played. I didn't have a microphone. Um, and it worked for the small little intimate coffee gigs that I was doing at the time. The adjustment came when someone asked me to play at a benefit for a fallen officer, um, there were 500 people in the room. Guess what? It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know it until I was there. Um, because again, I was ignorant to it. I did not know what to expect. It worked for all my coffee gigs for the last, up, up that point, up to like a year and a half. And so I walked in with my little thump speaker and I plugged it into my computer and no one beyond where I was standing could hear me. The other 490 people could not hear me. <laughs> so I started looking and researching and um, found the Bose system. And at the time I was you know, working and I said, you know what, I'm just going to make the investment. And that's what I did. And I love it. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, those Bose systems are so perfect for doing solo gigs. People use them all around the world for that reason. So that's interesting that that was the first upgrade from your small system, like we've seen some other members use. And the Bose system is clever because, I mean, it's really portable and it sounds great, but it's also got an integrated mixer in the back, right? It does. <laughs> oh, it's small, handy. It's, it's small, it's compact, it's light. Um, it's got the uh, four plugs in the back that I can use. I plug in, so I plug in my computer, I plug in my uh, wireless mic, and I plug in as a mic to that I speak with, or if somebody wanted to come up and sing, they can use that as well. So those are the three uh, the three plugs that I use uh, consistently. Easy peasy, right? So when you say Easy. your computer, you're taking you're taking your laptop with you, and are you running all of your tracks off your laptop? I do, sir. Yeah. So uh, that's a really simple setup. Even though you've got your bigger speaker, which you obviously need to have mains power for, uh, you've got the flexibility of having. You know, you can play in a small venue with that too, can't you? But you can yes. also play in a, in a much bigger room uh, and uh, and still not that many cables. So, okay, a couple questions about that then. So when you're using your laptop for your backing tracks, how are you playing your laptops? Are you using any 
piece of software to manage all of your tracks or just do it like in iTunes, something like that? It's in iTunes. Um, and again, so now we're back to that whole ignorant. I, I, one of the things I enjoy about the community is that there's so much uh, you know, wealth of information and people that do different things. So what GB is talking about here is our sax school community, because as a member, you're part of a worldwide community of thousands of learners. And it's surprising the information that's getting passed around inside our community where other members are sharing tips and advice on how they learn and practice, but also guess what? The sort of gear that they use when they're playing live. So there's been some really vibrant discussions going on inside our community about different ways that you can manage your backing tracks when you're performing a solo gig. We've covered it a little bit inside the PDF guide. And if you haven't grabbed that yet, the link is down below. It's free resource and in there, you'll get some tips about the apps and um, pieces of software you can use to manage your backing tracks, but also there's information about sound systems, PA setups, even how to structure your gig. Go check it out, the link's down below. Right, let's get back to it. For me at this point, yes, it's, everything's loaded onto iTunes. Um, and then you know, they have a setup that, you know, the songs stop after each song so they don't just run continuously. There's loads of different options. It's been quite interesting having the discussion in the community about it, actually. A lot of people now are using their iPads and there's some great apps where you can make playlists on your on your iPad. And I guess it's just a bit more compact, but you've also got a lot more options when you use your whole computer. And in um, iTunes, you could also make playlists up for different types of gigs. So I imagine you'd, do you do that if you're a different set for a coffee gig versus, versus a, a benefit gig or something? Exactly. So that's exactly what I do. Um, so you, you nailed it. Um, you know, so you don't even need to talk to me. You already know what I do. <laughs> uh, but yes, I have different, I have, um, for house parties, um, for club, for coffee shops. So, and you know, each, you know, different styles of music go into each, um, each category. So to try to make it, you know, to fit as well as you can. Yeah. And also it, it streamlines the process for next time you do that type of gig, right? So exactly. You, you doing things once to prepare for the future. So the other question I have for you is, do you use any effects on your saxophone? So the only effect, so, you know, it's interesting because I, we just had a conversation in the community um, where Tim Hall says that he uses um, a delay on his and I've never tried it and I haven't gotten brave enough to try it yet. Uh, but so the only thing that I use is reverb. And can you do that from within the Bose mixer? Yep. So everything is preset to, so that's again, the nice thing for me is when I, if you call me out tomorrow and you say, Hey, Greg, come play with me. Not that you would, I wish you would, but <laughs> I, why not? Stop it. So um, I would bring my uh, my small mixer, and everything is preset in, in here already. So all I have to do is open up my uh, open up the case, plug in my master into uh, wherever your output is, and it's already set up to go with the reverb. I never have to make any adjustments. Yeah, that's fantastic. Really, really great. And you're not using any music then when you play. You're just using the computer for the backing tracks. Correct. Yeah. Um, every, every once in a while, I, I'll go sit in with someone and I do exactly the same thing. If I go sit in, I'll bring this and my, and my uh, speaker. I just start playing. You've really got your setup streamlined, which is important when you're doing lots of gigs. Uh, so what about, uh, are there any things that you can imagine you might change with your setup? Have you got any uh gear envy things you're looking at that you might upgrade to well you, you know we always have gear envy right and so there's an uh, upgraded um uh, mixer that has eight eight outlets on it and so i want it i have no purpose for it because <laughs> i don't have eight things that i plug in i actually have the three but because it's an upgrade as well uh as far as the, the mechanisms um i'm kind of looking at that there's also a new Bose tower as well that's newer than mine. Um, that, with the, like you said, the envy, the wish list. Yeah, um, it's shiny. Those Must are, be better. are on the wish list. So if you were talking to somebody who was looking to do this now, I said, GB, they came to you and said, hey, GB, I'm going to go out and do lots and lots of gigs. Uh, what setup should I go for? Would you suggest that they go straight for something like the Bose uh, L1 that you have? So, yes. So, um, just like with my saxophone, I bought my saxophone. I didn't know where, where I was going to go and how, you know, 
how it's going to be received. But I knew that I want in my mind what I wanted. I wanted to play bigger gigs. So I, I, I went out on my first and only saxophone is a professional saxophone. I should have done that initially with my speaker system, but I didn't. And so the next system I bought was something that would uh, supposedly carry up to four or 500 people according to their printout. So I would say, yes, if you have the money and it doesn't have to be Bose, there's a lot of systems out there, but you want to get something that is capable of covering a larger venue. And you can always turn down the sound and play it in a smaller venue. So it's always better to to buy buy once instead of buying five pieces of equipment and upgrading each time. Just jump, you know, just jump in and buy it right off the bat. The other thing I want to ask you about, GB, I know recently you moved from one part of America to another part of America, which meant making a whole bunch of new contacts and going out to try and find new types of gigs. So can you tell us a little bit about how that process worked for you and what things you found helped you to get through that as quick as possible? I think the, the biggest um, thing that I learned was that flyers and posters didn't work all that well. It really is about connections, it's about the human connection. It's about making contacts and getting out there um, and pressing palms, I call it, you know, pressing palms, shaking hands, kissing babies, and going out there and meeting and making that verbal contact and that verbal connection. There's there's no substitute for that. Well, other than playing. <laughs> yeah. And then getting to those open mics and letting people hear you. And that was really how it began. Initially, I came out, I was handing out business cards and I had beautiful flyers set up and I'm handing those out left and right. And I could not get a bite. I could not get anyone to, uh, to give me a try. Um, and it, it was about six months. I, I couldn't find wow. anything. Um, and like I, I think I told you earlier, it does a little bit to your ego, your self-esteem that, you know, to hear no that many times. And my wife is in the background going, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And, and, and the inside you're going, no, it's not. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't work here. Um, but it was when I started going to the open mics and I started talking to other people. I would talk to my doctor. I talked to the, you know, the, as a, you know connections around the area that the people who knew, they would say, hey, go here, go there, go here, go there. And as I started visiting these places, um, it, it began to happen. But just the, the solo business cards and the flyers, they weren't, didn't have the turnaround or the, 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 yeah. the you know, that I wanted. Yeah, no, that's really good advice. And hey, look, I've been through this process a few times myself over my life when I've moved to different places in Australia, even when I came to live in England in 2000. I mean, uh, I had to start from scratch with contacts. Uh, luckily, by that point, I'd built up a massive contact base from you know all the other stuff in other places in the world. But you know, which helped me. But it was still about making contacts. And even uh, I launched a band over here uh, in the early days of being here, and we did a, the same thing as you. We went and we played for free in lots of venues, and uh, that we found that that really, really helped actually. Yep. You know, on a Wednesday night, I'll come down, we'll do a set. And, uh, you know, we, we played at one place and we said, just they'll, they'll pay us and they paid us in pizza squares, would you believe? <laughs> uh, but, you know, it was only a few months after that we were doing private gigs for Simon Cowell uh, and uh, playing on super yachts and stuff. So the thing is, you need to get out in front of people for them to yes. hear you to start the ball rolling. Uh, so good on you for doing that. And are you finding now that you've been in your new town for a little while that you're getting a nice base of gigs coming in? Most certainly, most certainly. There's a big turnaround now. Um, so one of the one of the biggest things that I did um, as a police chief, um, I always went to the Chamber of Commerce meetings and uh, any event that they had, I was I was um, I, I was always present there. You know, for people that you know, they want to see the chief. And so at it, not the smartest person in the world here. Took me six months to realize, you know, maybe I should go to the Chamber of Commerce. And that was the biggest turnaround for me. I went to the Chamber, press problems with them, spoke to them, and that became my first gig. Then they said, okay, I have all these events throughout the summer. How would you like to play at some of those? Perfect. They also host weddings there. I became the preferred vendor for their weddings. Again, perfect. That exposed me to the people throughout the community, which got me even more gigs. But that was the turnaround, the going back to the Chamber of Commerce, pressing problems with them, getting to know them, and that opened up the doors, and it's been wonderful ever since.
Wow, so many great tips in there. And I particularly like that last section where GB was breaking down how he went through the process of finding new gigs in a brand new town. This is something that all of us find difficult, but it's great to see that it's worked out well for him. And hopefully there's some great advice that you could put into action there too. So don't forget, it's great to get your saxophone out, go meet people, be brave, go to those open mics, mics, go and meet venue owners, offer to play for free even. It's just about getting out, showing people what you can do to make those connections. And before you know it, you'll have a roster of gigs for you, for yourself as a solo artist too. I really hope you found these things interesting. Don't forget to grab the PDF in the link down below. Keep practicing hard and I'll catch you on the next video.